Take out that sheet that you had last class. I don't know if you have it with you. This guy looks similar to this with a flow chart. The step we're going to talk about tonight is step seven. The step seven on that flow chart talks about gas phase reactions with pressure drop. Up to now, we considered our plug flow reactive. We've got PN coming in at an initial pressure P0 and we've got leaving at P. So far, we've considered P is equal to P0. Tonight, we're going to show how we're going to change and take that assumption away. But just to warm up, I thought to recap a little bit of information before we get to that point. I just want to recap the information for plug flow reactors so we're all very comfortable with plug flow system. So let's take a look at the plug flow reactor. This is not in the notes, not on the handout we're going to do. This is this is extra. So let's see if I'm so the mole balance we divide by dn, j by dv is equal to rj. And that derivation was assuming that along my reactor, I have some profile from the entrance to the point where I leave. I've got some profiles <coughs> changing along that direction. So this direction at the very beginning, v is equal to zero. By the time I leave, v is capital zero. And along that profile, we'll see the change in the concentration of the species. What we're very interested in is what is leaving at the exit, obviously. So I'm going to achieve a certain conversion x. And the last two classes, we've shown that fa, if I'm just looking at species a, is fa naught 1 minus x. We're, we're very familiar with that expression right now. And so if I take the derivative of that, dFA is equal to minus FA naught dx. And I can then rewrite that integral as follows. FA naught, the integral from over, over the x that I'm interested in, dx minus RA is equal to the integral over dv. And a few things can come out of that integral. There's some constants that I can pull out. So fa naught 
is there. I can also take out K, CA naught. Those remain constant. And then I can leave what's inside the integral is varying. It's 1 plus x naught x over. totally in terms of conversion x dx. general equation. So we know for liquid systems that there is general, most often there's no expansion and contraction for liquid phase systems. So for liquid systems we can ignore um, that change in, in volume. For gas phase systems, epsilon is equal to delta times ya naught. Delta is, is in many cases is non-zero and so epsilon is non-zero and we cannot ignore so we'll always use the most general equation and then simplify it from there on. So the key issue here is to recognize that I can find my volume of my reactor here, V, as a function of conversion x. Another way of looking at that is to say, see it as the following. I can plot along my profile here what this conversion is going to be. So I'm, I'm very interested in, as I go from the entry point to the exit, what my volume, uh, what my conversion is going to be. So right at the entry point, I'm integrating from zero to zero. So at the entrance, I'm integrating from zero to zero, my conversion is zero. But then what is the shape of this profile? I mean, Depending on the rate expression, it may, may look something like that as I go across the length of my reactor from beginning to end. This is the example for a first order system. A second order system, uh, sorry, a second order system. A first order system would be more simpler than this. A first order system, you could likely integrate this analytically. My focus in this course isn't so much on integrating these things. Right? We've got computers that do that efficiently for us and do it without mistakes. So let's let them do that. Let us focus on just setting up the problem and then turning it over to the computer when necessary. But let's recognize what we're aiming to do here. I want to see what my conversion looks like as a function of volume. So my x-axis here is volume V. So if I want to solve what this profile looks like, I have to say at a certain volume, what is my conversion x? Or I can do it the other way around. For a given conversion, find where I am along that volume axis. Which one would you do? Probably the second one. It's a whole lot easier if you look at that integral. It's a whole lot easier to specify what x is, your y value on this axis, and solve the integral and plug it what v is, and then, then plot that x v coordinate on the graph. Repeat that over and over. It's, late, it's much, much harder to put x and then solve for v. Uh, it's much harder to put in v and solve for x. Okay, so you definitely want to give x and solve that differential equation and then come down and get, and get your v. The other thing I would like to point out uh, can I erase this integral? Let's just go back to this question on expanding gas phase systems. We had over here, and we used this fact that Q is equal to Q naught on the x one x. I can also write it as Q over Q naught is equal to one plus x one x. So let's just uh, end 
exercise that's got what I'm looking at here. Q naught is the entry flow rate, and Q is the exit flow rate, volumetric flow rate. So meters cubed per second. <coughs> and in general, Q naught will not be the same as Q. For a system where your gases are expanding as they react, Q is going to be greater than Q naught. For a system that's contracting, Q is going to be smaller than Q naught. So that's, that's apparent quite clearly here. In fact, 1 is positive, x is always a number between 0 and 1. So whether this ratio increases or decreases is going to be dependent on what epsilon is. That's equal to 1 plus delta y a naught times x. Where delta, delta is the amount by which the system expands. Let's take a look at some cases over here that could occur along the length of the reactor. So here's my, my horizontal axis is the value. So as I go from the entry point of my reactor to the exit point, and let's take a look at the base case where Q over Q naught is equal to 1. Okay, so this is my base case here. For a system where there's no expansion or contraction, my volumetric flow rate coming into my reactor is the same as, as leaving. For a system which, where epsilon is positive, as I go through my reactor, conversion should be increasing. So x is getting larger and larger as I go from left to right. If epsilon is positive, this ratio over here is going to start off at 1. So at the entry point of my reactor, I've got zero conversion, x is zero. So I start off at one, but as I proceed through my reactor, this will get greater and greater. So this is for epsilon positive, and similarly you'll have a curve for epsilon small. This is for a system where the gas phase is, is contracted. So, for example, this might be A going to 2B, and this would be the situation of 2A going to B, and just as a, as a hypothetical example. The lower one is where the gas phase is contracting. You're creating a fewer number of moles on the, on the product side than on the reactor side. I'm creating a greater volume of product that's occupying the space in the reactor. So my volumetric flow rate leaving is going to be greater at the exit than at the entry point. Because that volumetric flow rate is greater, the reactors spend less time in the reactor. Their residence time for this situation is smaller. So here, residence time is smaller. And as a result of that, your conversion drops relative to the case where you had no expansion. So the material spends less time in the reactor, it's going to get lower overall conversion. Essentially what that means is I need to build my reactor to be longer than it would otherwise have had. So that's just an implication of what that expansion and contraction is about. And it's a good recap of what we've looked at over the past about six classes or so, we've seen, seen these topics coming up. So this, this discussion here should be very comfortable for you. Also, we, we've looked at previously, but let's put it up here before we move on to the next, the next section. We've also seen this equation now from our from our specific energy table, CA, CA naught. Sorry, let me write this in terms of a general species. So CI is CI naught. Theta I minus mu I, and I'll talk about that in a second. Number X. 
And then we had over here that we've got this post multiplication of P over T naught. So this is the most general equation that shows the concentration leaving my reactor as a function of conversion. As a function of conversion, pressure, and temperature. And in the past few classes, we conveniently said pressure is constant, temperature is constant, so those terms reduced down to unity and we just work with this term up here. Now, tonight's class we're going to take away the constant pressure assumption. Okay, so just, uh, just for completeness, let's add here that theta i is equal to the flow rate of species i in divided by the flow rate of my basis a. <coughs> and mu i, this curly v thing that Total life to use is bit, uh, bi. Just for example, for a that is equal to minus a over a. For b that would be minus b over a. If I was dealing with species d, that would be plus d over a. Just so that you're comfortable with what that this Greek letter nu is intended. Okay, so, so this expression here for concentration is the most general expression. It always holds under all conditions. Now let's take a look at the realistic case of where pressure is not constant. So up to now we've said pressure P is P naught. Let's take that away and see what happens. And the system where that happens is the plug, uh, not the plug flow reactor, it's the packed bed reactor. So P is equal to P naught works well for a plug flow reactor and empty pipe is generally that is correct. But for a packed bed reactor, definitely not true anymore. And you may recall briefly from the first week we looked at the situation for uh, the mole balance for a packed reactor. Let's just add that up here so it can be, it can be clear. We said the differential equation for modeling a packed bed reactor is dFi by dW is equal to this rate I dash. Let's recall what that means. W is the rate of catalyst so in my pack bed I fill it with usually spherical particles of catalyst and the W is the total weight of that catalyst if I'm looking at plotting profiles in my reactor along the entrance to the exit point W is now my coordinate system. At the entrance, W is zero. I've got no catalyst at my entry point. At my exit point, I've got W equals capital W. So now my coordinate system changes from V to W. So that's just a recap of what, what we considered a few weeks ago, so you may have forgotten that. Let's just be clear what W's intention is here. Let's also just define again what R dash I is. It's the number of moles of I produced. It's a positive number, moles of I produced per second per kilogram of catalyst. So my rate expression for Catalytic reactions are in terms of the mass of catalyst, not in terms of the volume of the reactor anymore. Why is that? So the amount of material I'm going to 
produce or consume is going to be a function of the volume of the, of the mass of the catalyst. You have little catalyst, I'm going to produce little product. Okay, so the volume of the reactor is not, is not a, an important parameter at all. It's totally dependent on how much catalyst you have present in that reactor. So we model it in terms of that, that variable. over there on the very far left hand side, let's take a look at the, what it would mean for CA. So CA, I could write as CA, CA naught, 1 minus X. This still applies for a packed bed reactor. But here's the key part, P over P naught multiplied by T over T. In a packed bed reactor, my pressure at the entrance here is P naught. My pressure leaving is P, and that P leaving is a very, very different, obviously lower value than the pressure at the entrance. So P is always is always equal to, is always less than P naught, and it's a very significant drop in pressure. Okay, so my concentration term here must have that pressure dependence in it. Let's just add uh, some other other terminology that we're familiar with. FA naught is equal to Q naught. CA0, so right at the entrance of my reactor, the molar flow is equal to the concentration multiplied by the volumetric flow. And I can sum that in into this expression up over here. Let's just go back to that. Given that FA is equal to FA0, 1 minus x. I can write that expression, so that's DFA by the W over there. So again, this time DFA is equal to minus FA naught x. So I can re-express that differential equation as FA naught dx by the W is equal to minus R dash. So that negative comes from that differential over here. So let's, uh, let's substitute in uh, that FA naught is equal to Q naught times CA naught. So Q naught times CA naught dx by dW is equal to plus RA, uh, sorry, minus RA if I'm looking at it. So Q naught, C A naught, that's what it is that F A naught, I'm substituting for F A naught over there, dx by dw is equal to minus R A dash. And if I had a first order system, let's take the first order system of K A C A naught. I, I can write K A and we sub in here for CA, CA naught 1 minus X. Multiplied by pressure over P naught, T naught over T. That's right. So we get a bit of simplification, but very minor. by dw is equal to ka <coughs> 1 minus x over q naught 1 minus x. 
1 plus epsilon x and then pressure terms <coughs> and pressure terms P over P naught T naught over T. And let's call this dx and w is function 1 is a function of x and p. T is equal to t So I'm going to still, still consider only isothermal reactions, but so that allows me to take t is equal to t naught, but I'm going to only focus in this class on the pressure dependence. So this function over here is only a function of conversion x and pressure p. All the other terms in that expression are constant throughout the reactor. Conversion changes from the beginning of the reactor to the exit. Pressure changes from the beginning of the reactor to the exit. So we have to keep two variables now. In the past, up to this class, we've only had a single variable in there, only conversion. Now we're bringing a second variable in. One differential equation in two variables. Okay, to solve that, we need a second differential equation in, in the same two variables. And that's where we're going next in our derivation. Yes. This is for a first order reaction. If I subbed in minus Ra and its concentration dependence for a second order reaction, I would get something very different over here. Far more messy. But even for a first order reaction, this is really tough to integrate out of um, How would you drive your uh, type of reactor with your lower uh, pressure on the right? So in top right corner there, like if your outlet pressure is less than your inlet pressure. Wait, never mind. Add back into that. Yeah. <laughs> so what we need to 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 try and integrate this integral is some expression that tells me how pressure is changing along the reactor. Clearly, the pressure at the entrance is P naught, the pressure at the exit is P, but what does it look like in between? What are the factors that you guys think are the parameters that would influence that pressure drop? <coughs> catalyst weight, would catalyst weight affect it? Which, are, which parameters would, would influence the pressure change? What are going to be the important variables here in our, in our uh, derivation for pressure as a function of distance along the reactor? How packed the catalyst is? Yep. Consumption? Consumption of? Like a A, like if you're producing more and more here. Okay, so this epsilon term should be yeah. important, right? So if my reaction is producing uh, more moles or it's consuming more moles, Anything else? Flow rate. How fast is my gas velocity through that pack bed? Anything else? Particle size of the catalyst. So very, very small catalyst particles are going to have a very different pressure drop than large catalyst particles. It also comes back to this idea of how catalyst catalyst is. Okay, so all these terms are going to show up. So that's what's in the handout in front of you. It's the very the first side of the page called the Ogden equation for pressure drop in PBR. And you can see why this is a handout, because I really don't want you to write what's on this page off the wall. Because you're going to make mistakes with this. This is a messy equation. But there it shows me what pressure looks like along the distance of the reactor. So let's take a look at this Z coordinate that's introduced in the equation. Z is the distance along my reactor bed. So at the entrance, Z is equal to zero, and at the exit, Z is some capital Z, just whatever the final length of the reactor is. Actually, from 0 at the entrance to, to z at the exit. So that's what dp by dz is. dp by dz is an inter a differential equation that tells me how pressure drop varies depending on where I am along the length of my reactor. And it's exactly a function of the variables that most of you mentioned there. 
phi, the porosity, the volume of the void divided by the total bed volume. What's the typical value for porosity? 0.5? Lower than 1. Lower than 1. Okay. <laughs> Greater than 0, lower than 1. Absolutely, 0 0.5, 0 0.4 would be typical for most catalysts. So what that says is the value of porosity equal to 0.4 is that 40% of your packed bed is empty space. 60% of your bed of your reactor is, is the actual catalyst. So 1 minus 5 is in the next row bed volume of solid. So 5, 40%, 60% of it is actual catalyst, 40% is empty space. GC, the term GC in the denominator there, that's equal to 1. I will always work in SI units. So GC in that instance is 1. If you're working with other companies or American companies, they will use the uh, other units. Diameter of the particle, dp, d subscript p in the denominator there refers to the catalyst's diameter. GC is just a conversion factor. If you're working in the metric system, there's no need to convert. That's why we like metric. It's just a conversion factor to get your units consistent. The viscosity of the gas, mu, is also an interesting one. <coughs> and so we, we didn't talk about mu earlier, but mu, the viscosity of the gas, is for the most part assumed to be constant across the reactor from beginning to end. From beginning to end. And then the term g there refers to the superficial mass velocity. g is a constant. Let's take a look at what g is. It's important to understand what capital G is. Capital G is a constant because it's the mass flow per cross-sectional area per unit time. And it's the same at the entrance as at the exit because of the steady state assumption. So that's key. Our steady state assumption is what allows us to say that G at the entrance is the same as the exit. My steady state mass in is equal to mass out. Let's take a look at the units of G. It's kilograms per unit time per unit cross-sectional area. So if you think of a cross-sectional slice in that reactor, so here's a cross-sectional slice area here is equal to A subscript C, let's call it for cross-sectional area. It's how much kilograms per second passes through this imaginary slice so it's kilograms per time, kilograms per second, per meter square. Also known as flux. So you've probably seen it in math courses or other courses as flux in your mass transfer course. So mass flux in my reactor is constant because of the steady state assumption. It's the same at the beginning and the end. But let's take special note that G is the product of two variables, both of which are changing. So G is the density multiplied by the velocity. For G to remain constant implies that if density goes up, velocity must go down to compensate for it and vice versa. And that's in, well, that is exactly what happens in the reactor. Density is not constant from the entry point to the exit point. And that should be fairly clear for a system that's producing more moles as it on the right hand side of the reaction, you're producing more moles, you're creating material per unit volume, your density is changing, it's going up. Something has to compensate for that velocity in order to keep that balance for G constant. So the key, key insight here is that both the velocity of U and the density rho are changing, but the mass flow is not. Let's introduce another symbol here, n dot. <coughs> which is kilograms per second. So that is my mass flow.
I can write that as rho times q north at the entrance. So m dot is the mass flow. That m dot is the same as rho north times q naught. I want, I want to calculate what rho is as it's changing throughout the reactor. So we have from before that Q is Q naught, Q naught over P, T over T naught, multiplied by 1 plus epsilon x. So we derived this a few classes ago. I just wanted, before, uh, before moving on here, just talk about the 1 plus epsilon x term. Just recap that, that 1 plus epsilon x is equal to 1 plus delta times y a naught times x. And that's the same as 1 plus delta y a naught is the ratio of the flows f a naught over the total flow f t naught. So the molar flows, it's another way that you can write y a naught. Okay. Just want to emphasize that. And then that's This 1 plus epsilon x term, we've also seen that called the total flow divided by the total flow in. Flow in leaving my reactor divided by the total flow coming into my reactor. So there's this relationship here. So one thing I can do is I can, instead of writing 1 plus epsilon x here, I can write it as ft over ft naught. So let me, let me erase that and, and do that, or let me rather just write it as a new line. So finally, what I can, that allows me to do is re-express rho in terms of, of temperature and pressure. So I can determine how my density is changing along my reactor. So rho north, rho is equal to rho north P over rho north T naught over T and F T naught over F T. The reason for that is so that in my Bogan equation, if you go and look on your handouts there, the very first term in the denominator is rho. I can now go substitute what rho is. Rho is equal to this ratio of pressure, ratio of temperature, ratio of molar flows, multiplied by my initial density. So right there, that very first term in the Bogan equation, in the denominator, I have rho. I can go sub in what that row expression is. And that gets me the equation that's still on the first page of the handout, but near, near the bottom of the page. So dp by dz is equal to minus g1 minus 5. And then on the end of that equation, you see p naught over p, t over t naught, and t over t. That's where it comes from, from substituting in this dependence of density on temperature and pressure. Okay, so it makes absolute sense to us. If we look at this equation and we try to interpret it, we can see that my density leaving my reactor, rho, will be greater than the entry density. 
So leaving density is greater than it, and the entry density, if pressure has gone up, so the P's over P naught is greater than one, the density leaving is going to be less. That makes absolute sense. If temperature leaving is greater than what's coming in, my density also is going to go up. And again, my ratio of my flows, if my total flow coming in is lower than what's leaving, then my density is going to increase. So all of those make, make intuitive sense. And we sum that into the Logan equation. So where I'll end off with is the bottom of page one, we get this expression from P by dz is minus beta zero. All those terms in beta are constant. So that's important to note. Beta zero is constant in the reactor. All the other terms will change from the beginning point to the exit point of the reactor. T over T over, oh, sorry, so at, at, yeah, at half the temperatures, you're going to get a number that's smaller than one, yes, you're going to get a lower density. Yeah, so, sorry, I think I said it wrong around the first time. Higher temperatures will end. Okay, so what we'll do tomorrow is we'll put the page over and continue the rest of the generation. That's quite a to the pressure on top.